Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. Hopefully, I'm sort of kind of back on schedule uh, and uh, getting my days right. Actually, I had my days right when I did my filming last week, but I had forgotten that Scott uh, Fisher was going to continue filming for, through Monday and Tuesday, so that's why I uh, erroneously uh, said what day it was. So, anyway, glad to be back. Hope you had a fantastic Labor Day weekend. And hope you were safe. It's time to get back to morning musings. And we, we are continuing our study of the Olivet Discourse. We have been focused for a good bit of time now on Matthew 25, 14 and following in the parable of the absent master. Listen, as I've suggested to you, uh, in some ways, this parable and all of the parallel par parables and all of the teaching in the New Testament about the coming of the Lord are about the return of the absent master. It really doesn't matter if you're talking about 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 21 and following in the parousia of Christ at the resurrection. Doesn't matter if you're talking about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and the parousia of Christ for the gathering, which is the harvest that we get to momentarily. Doesn't matter if you're talking about Acts chapter 1. This same Jesus, who, whom you have seen taken from you, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. That's the re promise of the return of the absent master. Thus, if we get a handle on and if we understand the framework, the context, that all of the parables present for us for the timing of the coming of the return of the absent master, then we have, as it were, the hermeneutical key for unlocking when every one of these passages that I have just mentioned would take place. It is completely misguided to try to divorce, and Milton Terry, the noted commentator of the 19th century, made this observation in Acts chapter 1, to roughly paraphrase. It really doesn't matter what we might think about what was being promised in Acts chapter 1. It is a miscarriage of exegesis and hermeneutic to divorce it from all of the other New Testament time statements that say that the coming of the Lord was near in the first century. Well, he's certainly correct on that. We have to have some really, really, really strong evidence to divorce Acts chapter 1 from all of the other, these other passages. But we will get to that discussion. What we are focused on now is, as I have hinted at over the last couple of videos, and as I have promised over the last couple of videos, I want to look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, as one of the incredibly foundational texts for determining when the absent master would return. Daniel was told, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy people, and I'll just skip over the you know, five of the other constituent elements, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, I wrote a book some years ago entitled 70 Weeks Are Determined for the Resurrection. Because, you see, it hit me one day that so many of the constituent elements found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, have to do with the eschatological consummation. None, uh, none of them have more to do with that climactic consummation than the promise of the bringing in of everlasting righteousness. In Galatians 5, in verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, We, according to the Spirit, eagerly await the hope of righteousness. Now, as I have posed the question to you before, I hope that you will consider this carefully. Was Paul anticipating the arrival of a different world of righteousness from what Daniel was predicting? You know, one of the most common views about Daniel chapter 9 is that the 70 weeks were ended, completed, consummated, and fulfilled by A.D. 34 and 35. One of these days, 
I'm going to have an entire series of videos on that question. In the meantime, I'm going to be writing an article or two on that question. I believe it is simply false to suggest that the 70 weeks ended in A.D. 70. Let me explain why ever so briefly. 70 weeks were determined to bring in everlasting righteousness. That means that if if the 70 weeks ended in A.D. 34-35, that means the everlasting world of righteousness was fully established in 34-35. Now, make no mistake, all right? The coming of the Lord Himself in His incarnation. And, and Christ is our righteousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 30 and 31. No question about it. But you see, Christ initiated the work of establishing the new creation through his death, burial, and resurrection. Thus, Paul could say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man is in Christ, he is new creation. Well, the new creation is the world of righteousness. So there's no question about it. The new creation, the world of righteousness, had been initiated. But, but, here is Paul writing in approximately 49 A.D., saying, we are looking for the world of righteousness. Now, some people want to try to use the Greek verbs or the Greek tenses when it talks about Christ is our righteousness and the new creation had already come, and they say, well, it, it, it's a done deal, done deal. Just this last week, I had somebody saying, well, Paul was ever bit as much forgiven, ever bit as much saved prior to A.D. 70 as he would be afterwards. Sorry, folks, that's just not true. It is sometimes argued the atonement had to have been finished at the cross. Well, and that's simply not true. And so it's argued, since Paul said in Romans chapter 5, that in Christ we, we have a past tense, received the atonement, must be a done deal. No, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, Christ had to return the second time apart from sin for salvation, chapter 10, verse 1, for. Here's the reason Christ had to return. For the law having a shadow of the good things that are about to come. Well, that second coming would be the consummation of the atonement. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined to make the atonement. Christ had to return to consummate the atonement that he had initiated through his death, through his ascension. It was a process begun. Thus, the process of bringing in everlasting righteousness had begun through the personal ministry, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ, but it would be consummated at the parousia. Thus, Paul, writing well after A.D. 34 and 35, was still looking for the fulfillment of Daniel 9, 24, when he said, according to the Spirit, through the Spirit, we look for, eagerly expect, uh, the Greek word that is translated uh, eagerly look for, is apec decomai, and it means an eager, expectant, looking for. It's not something, well, it might happen one of these years, it might be 2,000 years, it might be 40,000 years. No, no, no. This is they were expecting it. We look for the hope of righteousness. So that righteousness foretold by Daniel to occur within the 70 weeks had not yet arrived. Just like Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, according to his promise, which was an Old Testament promise, we look for a new heaven and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Okay, here's Peter who said he was looking for the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises of the new heaven and the new earth and the, and the world of righteousness. Well, obviously, Isaiah 65 and 66 foretold what? The new heaven and new earth. That means they were looking for, or it predicted, 
the coming of righteousness of Daniel 9. But that means if they were, if, if, if the new heaven and new earth of Isaiah 65 and 66 is what Peter was looking for to be fulfilled, and if the new heaven and new earth is the world of righteousness foretold by Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, then that means that Daniel 9 and the 70 weeks had not already been fulfilled in A.D. 34 and 35. Do you see how important it is for determining the correct answer for Daniel chapter 9? Likewise, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down from God out of, out of heaven. And I saw the new Jerusalem adorned as a bride for her husband. This is the new creation. This is the world of everlasting righteousness of 2 Peter 3. It's the world of righteousness of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5. And it's the world of righteousness, <coughs> everlasting righteousness of Daniel chapter 9. But wait. If the coming of the new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem of Revelation 21 and 22 is the world of righteousness foretold by Daniel chapter 9, then that means that the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9 were not fulfilled in A.D. 34 and 35. Daniel 9 doesn't say 70 weeks are determined to initiate everlasting righteousness and then we, it'll come sometime after the 70 weeks. No, 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 no. 70 weeks are determined to bring in everlasting righteousness. You know, it's amazing when people go to 2 Peter 3, Revelation 21 and 22, even Galatians chapter 5 and 5 and say, well, we're still waiting for that. Well, listen to me, folks. If we're still waiting for that everlasting world of righteousness of uh, Galatians 5, 2 Peter 3, Revelation 21 and 22. If we're still waiting for that, unless you can prove that that world of righteousness foretold in those New Testament passages, unless you can prove that's a different world of righteousness from that which was foretold by Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, then of absolute necessity, what you are saying is Daniel 9 is not fulfilled yet. And that means there's a 2,000 year gap. In Daniel chapter 9. There is no 2,000 year gap. But if, if we admit and agree that that world of righteousness mentioned in those New Testament passages which I have adduced, and if we agree that's the world of righteousness of Daniel chapter 9 verse 24, then since Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 looks absolute and following looks no later than the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 then that means that means Galatians 5 2 Peter 3 Revelation 21 and 22 was fulfilled no later than AD 70 and covenant eschatology is absolutely 100% proven to be true and that means that all futurist eschatologies is proven 100% to be false. Hey, thanks for joining me for this, morning, morning, this morning's morning musings. Hey, go to my website, donkpresta.com, bibleprophecy.com. Order this book, 70 Weeks Are Determined for the Resurrection. Uh, listen, it will blow you away how powerfully, when, when you see the evidence, how clear it is that Daniel 9 was predicting the resurrection. Now, like I said, I'm going to show you how that relates to Israel's feast days. I've been working up to that, and that's where we're headed on the flip side. I'll see you there.